Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Cryptic Conversations. I'm your host, Tunes from the Crypt, and we have another very special episode in store today. Today's guest is a man named Robert Biddo. Robert is an author, entrepreneur, and podcast host. He has had over 25 years of experience in Mexico as a student, as an employee for a large multinational corporation, and as an owner of an import business founded in 1999 called Sueños Latin American Imports. Robert is the creator of the Mexico Unexplained podcast, which is a podcast that explores various mysteries, legends, and cultural phenomena of Mexico. It covers a wide range of topics, including ancient civilizations, folklore, paranormal encounters, and unsolved mysteries. The aim of the podcast is to shed light on lesser known aspects of Mexico's rich history and culture, providing listeners with intriguing insights and thought provoking discussions. So welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. It's it's, uh, it's an honor to have you. I think this is a nice change of pace. I've had a lot of uh, my podcast is definitely leaning towards spirituality at the moment. So and, uh, you know, I, I always enjoy uh, discussing, you know, the paranormal spooky stories and folklore. So I'm really excited to dive into this conversation with you today. So um, great. Yeah. There's a lot to talk about. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, to kick things off, you know, talk to me about your early life. Where did you grow up and, and what was your family like? Well, I grew up in New Mexico. So that's like a blend of, you know, Latin America and the United States. So it was interesting when I was a kid, I grew up with a lot of legends that I would later find out are in Mexico, like the Llorona, for example. Yeah. Um, but I you know, grew up in New Mexico, then went to school in Mexico for one semester and then got my degrees and all that stuff and then worked for a, a large company in two countries, in Brazil and also Mexico. And while I was in those two countries, I traveled around and all that stuff. And I, you know, like I said, I worked for this big corporation. Then when I got tired of that, I quit. And that was 1998, a long time ago. Yes, I'm old. Um, <laughs> and the following year, 1999, I started this import business that you referenced at the beginning. And that took me through the, the, the back country of Mexico. And when I was visiting the back country, which I still do 25 years later to get my merchandise, I import more, mostly arts and crafts. And while I was tra while I travel around, I hear all of these stories and legends and, you know, anything. And a lot of these things that I've heard and been exposed to are not known outside of Mexico or even outside the regions in Mexico where I've, you know, heard about this stuff. So then I started this podcast, I guess, like eight years ago, right? Or 20, 2016, I started Mexico Unexplained. And um, what I do is a weekly show where I explore, as I say, the magic, the mysteries and the miracles of Mexico. And I've also written a couple of books on the topic, on these various topics. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've, I'm really into this stuff. <laughs> and it's 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 a it's a product, a byproduct, I guess, of my business that I've owned, you know, for 25 years now. So it's been fun. Nice, nice. So what part of Mexico, you said you did, you did one semester and then you kind of worked in Mexico. So what part of Mexico were you in? I was, I when I was a student, I was in Morelia, Michoacan, which I just love. And then when I was working for the big U.S. company, I was in their corporate headquarters in Mexico City. So I was like right in the thick of things there. Yeah. And that was interesting because I was very young back then. You know, uh -huh. I was, it was 1995 that I was yeah. down there. So, you know, I was just this young guy and it was, it was a heck of a, an experience for me. Okay. And so, um, you also have a master's degree. Talk about your educational career. Um, how far did you, did you go? Well, what I did is I combined an MBA, a master of business administration with an MA in Latin American studies. Mm. So what I did in that MA I went to the University of New Mexico and that master's in Latin American studies is always ranked up there with Harvard and Yale and, you know, the eyes, nice. because it's, it's just a fantastic program. And I learned a heck of a lot by doing that. And so 
I combined those two deg- two master's degrees. And then that's when, you know, a few years after graduation, I got this job that because I, in the the master's program, I became fluent in Spanish and Portuguese, in Mm. addition to knowing, you know, learning about the cultures and everything, which is very, very important when you're doing business. That's something that is not emphasized a lot. But if you know the culture where you're going, you you bridge this gap. Oh, yeah. And it's been very beneficial to me. And people ask me, you know, how have I survived for 25 years doing my own business? importing arts and crafts of, of all things. I think knowing the cultures and being close to the people, that's what's helped me. But so I graduated with these two master's degrees. I did them concurrently. And then, you know, a big company swooped me up and, you know, I was immediately sent over, you know, overseas. I went to, like I said, Brazil and Mexico city. And when I was in Mexico city, I was traveling on the weekends and you know buying arts and crafts for my own collection Mm -hmm. and when it was time for me to ditch corporate america i said okay i'm gonna open up a business where i'm buying and selling arts and crafts and i'm still doing it (laughs) yeah that's that's awesome so yeah i think you're a a perfect example of 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 what it's like for someone who follows their path you know this this you can just tell like this is your path and, and you're following it you know like you said you grew up with these these uh these uh, stories, the, the folklore, um, and then you, you went to school for it. And, you know, you're, you're definitely doing what's meant for you in this life. Um, and you know what? It hasn't been easy. <laughs> okay. A lot of people see what I do and they say, I mean, I've had people say, you've got the dream life. You get to travel and, you know, buy all this stuff. But let me tell you, it's been hard sometimes. I've, I'm pretty good right now. Uh, Everything's real good right now. But I mean, sometimes, I mean, you could go back 15, 20 years with my business and it was rough. I mean, I was having a hard time, but yeah, I stuck with it. And anybody who's listening to this, who is considering entrepreneurship, whether it's just, you know, some internet gig you got going on that you feel is your passion, do it and never give up. And that's, you know, people ask me, what, what's your secret to longevity in your business? And even in my YouTube show, because I don't have a million subscribers. I don't yeah. have a Joe Rogan following, whatever. You just never give up. You just keep doing it. And, nice. you know, whatever happens, happens. It's it's all good. <laughs> that's nice. All. Yeah, I, I love that. Yeah. And um, that's awesome that you you learn Portuguese too. You know, I, I want to learn Portuguese because it's it's similar to Spanish, right? I feel like it's got a, a French element to it, and uh, and then you know you can go, yeah, like you said, Brazil, all over South America, and and travel with that, and be able to communicate with the people over there. So yeah, you can yeah. you can pretty much travel all of North America, and South America. Now you need to learn like uh, Chinese and start head, heading that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay, so so you kind of touched on it for a second there, but. What inspired the passion for starting Mexico and explained, was there one pivotal moment um, that you can remember that uh, inspired the passion for starting it? Yeah, I was on a plane. I was getting settled in my seat on a plane from Guadalajara to Phoenix, Arizona. And I had a magazine in my hand that was my favorite magazine. It was called Muy Interesante. It's still, it's still being published. And it's paranormal stuff having to do with Mexico. So I'm sitting in my seat, and I think this was like around 2010, 2012, something like that. And I'm sitting in my seat, flipping through their magazine, and then I saw an article about crop circles. And the crop circles article was written by Mexican scientists with Mexican analysis about Mexican crop circles. And I was like, oh, these are cool patterns. I've never seen this before. In fact, a lot of the stuff that I have come across, I have not heard of outside of Mexico. A lot of these stories, like people don't know, there's an equivalent of the Loch Ness Monster. There's equivalent of the Bermuda Triangle. There are two Bigfoot creatures. There are a lot of legends about witches, all this stuff that no one knows about. So that would be the pivotal moment. That's interesting Mm -hmm. that you asked me that because there is a pivotal moment. When I was on that plane and I was getting ready to take off, that's when it hit me. And I put it in the back of my head. I thought maybe I could write a book, whatever. But then 
YouTube started right about then. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it took me a few years to get my act together, you know, and then I started the show in um, early 2016. And it's been great. Nice. I love it. Yeah. I feel like you're definitely very, very niche, very, very focused. I'm not sure of any, or you probably know of some of your competitors. Are there other channels like yours? I haven't heard of any other ones. No, you know, people will dabble in things, you know, there'll be like a Bigfoot channel that might touch on, you know, they might mention the Mexican Bigfoot creatures once or twice, or they'll have me on the show, right? Yeah. But they'll, they'll talk about legends here and there. I've, there's no one as consistent as I am, you know, because I come up with a show every, a long form show every week. And then throughout the week, I post shorts and TikTok. And yeah, so I'm the one that does things consistently. Nice. But there's a lot of material and a lot of material I've been exposed to personally. So I have, oh. I have 306, almost 360 shows right now. Or no, it's more than that. It's almost, it's close to 400 sh long-term oh, wow. show, long-form shows. And I have a long list of other topics that I need to cover. Wow. Of all of these little things. And I love it when the listeners and the readers, they contact me. And as you may know, the border is very fluid. So someone can come to me and say, you know what? I was born on this side was born, you know, I'm American, I was born on this side, but, you know, my parents came from down there. And every summer when I was nine and 10 years old, I got sent down there to live with grandma. And grandma lived in this tiny little village. And there's a cave outside the village where this two headed monster supposedly <laughs> lived. And I get people saying things like that to me. Uh -huh. And I go and investigate. And that those are the best leads that I get. Oh, wow. Telling you, yeah, people will tell me things. Those like are like that. some of the, the lesser known ones, huh? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting. There's a never ending source of material. And like I said, a lot of it is not even known outside of certain regions of Mexico. Like, for example, I'll give you an example. There's this blood sucking witch called the Tlahuelpuchi. And that <laughs> that's a that's a a witch, a phenomenon that's been going on supposedly for, it could be thousands of years old, this legend. Oh, wow. But in the 1950s, there was some young guy who was working at a government office in Tlaxcala City, the capital of the state of Tlaxcala. And he was looking at the death paperwork, the death certificates, you know, he was processing them as, mm -hmm. you know, just this office worker. And he was seeing the cause of death marked down with quite quite a, a, a big degree of frequency. The cause of death was chupado por la bruja, which means sucked by a witch. And so, oh, he, wow. yeah, he went to his supervisor and said, what is this chupado por la bruja? Why is it sucked by a witch? Why is, what's this cause of death? So then the government sent people to these tiny little villages in the state of Tlaxcala in the back country to investigate. And then that's when they, they, they found out that there was this legend there, you know, it was infant crib death, what was happening. And they were explaining it by saying that there's a shape shifting, witch that can shape shift into any animal and can shape shift down to a tiny little flea that can fly in a crack in your house and then materialize it to a woman and in your baby's bedroom and then go after the baby. Oh, wow. And so, and people in Tlaxcala city in the capital city, never even heard of something like this. So even in one of the tiniest States of Mexico, people weren't even aware of what was, what, what the beliefs were in their own state. And oh, so wow. I've heard about, I heard this story. I'm the only one that's putting it out there in English. I investigated it yeah. and everything and I put it all out there. Oh, so wow. the Tlaupuchi is now known to English speakers. Yeah. And she's also in my book. And I also, I'll show you, I came up with a coloring book. So I have a coloring book for monsters and the paranormal, you know, 
uh-huh. in connection with all of this stuff. But that's an example of something yeah. that was really, you know, obscure and, you know, not even known by other people within Mexico. Oh, wow. And it's something, Tlalapuchi, that's a native, it's a Nahuatl name. Uh-huh. And that goes back, I mean, the Spanish have been there for 500 years. It predates the Spanish, mm. some people say, by 1,000, 1,500 years. So that's a pretty old legend. So you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong. So you're saying that that legend, it was like very exclusive to like a little village of the of the area. And only the people in that little village knew about it. And the rest of the territory didn't even know about it. Right. Yeah. The yeah. rest of the state of Tlaxcala, I mean, in the capital city, very modern city, whatever. They didn't know what was going on in these little villages. And they didn't. I mean, most people don't know about that legend, but it took that one guy. Uh-huh. He was processing the death paperwork and he was like, what is this sucked by a oh, witch? Wow. What is, what's this cause of death? And then that's when they sent out investigators. And then, you know, then I found articles about it in oh. Spanish, you know? So you, so you were actually able to find like documents about it and stuff. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, so that, and that's, that's what I do with a lot of these topics. Yeah. People will tell me something or I'll find an obscure reference somewhere or, I could hit the jackpot because I'm in San Diego. You know, the border is, you know, right over here. Yeah. You know? I could be like Sarah Palin and say, I can see <laughs> Russia from my kitchen window. I can see <laughs> Mexico from my kitchen window. Yeah. No, but um, I can find like one time I scored at a rummage sale and I got a big stack of pulp magazines from Mexico, pulp paranormal and UFO magazines. Boy, what a gold mine that was because I got all of these stories about abductions, about ghosts, you know, whatever. And yeah, if you can, there, there's a lot of information that's out there, but you got to really dig and research it. Yeah. So I think it's going to be kind of hard for us to condense all of, all of the folklore into one episode. You know, I could probably yes. talk, talk to you all day. So, you know, I have a handful, awesome. handful of, of uh, notes that I, that I'm aware of. But I'm also interested, you know, if you could just tell the listeners, like, you know, what are some of the most fascinating mysteries or legends that you've explored and researched and and that you think the listeners should know about in regards to Mexico? Well, you know, it's interesting. People always ask me, what do you think about this stuff? What do you think this is real or that's real or whatever? The most popular legend that I have on my website, MexicoUnexplained.com and also YouTube is the legend of La Lechuza, which is a gigantic owl. You know, um, there's tecolote, there's lechuza. You can use those words for just a regular owl, but La Lechuza is this gigantic owl. And I'm inclined to believe that this could be a real creature. Um, Mm. There's mythology and legend connected with it, but the Rio Grande Valley of, of Texas And then also on the Mexican side, there are a lot of sightings of this big creature. And there's this old mythology that goes along with it that predates the Spanish. And once again, you have a woman who's marginalized or whatever, and she's the outcast and she turns to witchcraft. And then she transforms herself into a gigantic owl Mm -hmm. and then swoops down and takes livestock, takes livestock, kills kids you know, things like that. And if you shoot this big owl, then it falls out of the sky and then turns it back into a witch when it dies. Mm. Well, you know, they always say that legends, there's some truth to legends. Yeah, I'm inclined to believe that there is some big bird that's out there Mm. that hasn't been classified. It could be. I mean, there are so many empty spaces in Mexico and the US, if you want to think about it, if you've ever flown from like San Francisco to um, Washington or something, if you've flown across the United States, there's a lot of empty space. Same thing with Mexico. There are so, there's so much empty space. You think Mexico City, Guadalajara, Monterrey being really crowded. Yes, that's true. But once you go out, if you go into the Sierras, the, the mountains, whatever, the desert wildernesses and stuff, there are parts that are not explored or have only been explored recently, like within the past 150, 200 years. So a creature like that could exist. 
Yeah. So that's a fascinating um, legend. Another popular one is the Llorona. And if yeah. you're Mexican, American, Chicano, Hispanic from the Southwest, you know the story about a witch, well, a woman yeah. who was jealous of her husband for whatever reason. She all, always in the legend, it's two kids. She becomes jealous of, uh, jealous of her husband. She tries to get back at him by drowning her yeah. two kids mm -hmm. in a river. And then she has regret when the kids are drowning and she tries to go save the kids, but she can't. Okay. And so now she walks the riverbanks, the, the sides of Arroyos and Ezequias and dry creek beds looking for her kids. And it's a cautionary tale because if you, if you grew up in the Southwest, the desert Southwest, like I did in New Mexico, it can be raining 20 miles away and totally sunny where you are. And kids like me, when I was a kid there, we played in the arroyos all the time, the dry creek beds, basically. And I have seen with my own eyes as a little kid, these flash floods that just come out of nowhere, because like I said, it can be raining a long way away from you. So this and is so where, so, so this is where that uh, folklore originates from. What, what city is that? What area is that? Well, in New Mexico, that's where I grew up. But the yeah. the legend happens all the way from New Mexico and Southern Colorado and Texas, mm. the American Southwest, all the way down. They have that. They have the Yorona in yeah. Chile. They have it's all throughout the America. Oh wow! Okay. But um, you know, back to like back to what I was saying. Like when I was a little kid, you could be playing in the Arroyo, and then all this water comes down. You know, is coming at you. So people say that this isn't real it's a cautionary tale it's told to kids so that they don't play in these areas and get swept away by the flash flood but mm. when i was a kid i was with my fifth grade class and we were going to our teacher's house for a swim party we had to cross a bridge and we thought we saw her in oh, wow. the bottom of the ditch a, a lady dressed in black an old Hispanic lady dressed in black crawling out of the ditch. Now, why would there be an old woman in the ditch yeah. <laughs> in the middle of the day like that? And so one of the kids said, look, it's the Yorona. And then we all looked and we, you know, a couple of girl, the girls screamed or whatever. And we ran, ran, ran. I, I ran so hard and we were laughing because we didn't know what we really saw. Was that really her? You know, we like tumbled over each other and, you know, that was pretty interesting because that's one of the only times that I've had a personal con connection, personal connection to one of these legends. Yeah, so. I think uh, I think that's one of the most popular ones. So so my dad is Mexican and my mom is white. And yeah, my dad told me he has a story. I feel like everyone has a story about La Llorona, you know, and uh, I, I think he his family is from uh, the Texas area like mm -hmm. Monter Monterrey, Mexico. And yep. he, he he tells a story of, he says he remembers being in Mexico and they were at some house and, you know, him and his brothers, I don't know, it was late at night and they heard the weeping woman and they heard heard her crying. <laughs> and and what is that? What is that translation? La Llorona, it's weeping woman, right? Right, the crier. Yeah. Someone who's crying. But in Caribbean Spanish, like in the Dominican Republic or I think in Cuba too, or in Puerto Rico, in the, in uh, Car Caribbean Spanish, a Llorona is a crybaby. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, so you don't really, that's not the same thing. But I have a further connection to the Llorona okay. besides my childhood. There was a movie that came out a few years ago about her. And I bought tickets to be the, to see the first showing, you know. So I'm in the theater and I'm sitting there and I'm sitting in the theater and I look up at the screen and I couldn't believe my eyes because what was in that movie? And this is true. I'm I I got the receipts to prove it to. I looked up at the movie and I saw merchandise from my business that I only carry. Nobody else carries. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. Those are some of my pieces that are in the movie oh, as wow. props in the set, you know, on the set. And I was like, wait a minute, you know what? I got an order a year before from some movie production company 
Oh, wow. And they they had me send it to their production lot under the name, the movie, The Children, I guess, because they were keeping everything under wraps. Uh. They didn't want it to get out or whatever. But those pieces in that movie came from me. Oh, wow. Bizarre. That's cool. So it was like a connection. I saw the Yorona, supposedly, I don't know, right? When I was a kid, and then I go see the movie, and then my stuff, my own stuff is in the movie that I alone carry. And I know that it's my stuff because the 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 stuff is specifically designed for my business. There's no mm -hmm. other sales but through me. And then, like I said, I remembered you know, a year before, I did get an order from a production company, movie production company. So it was like... Wow, that's so that's the that's the weirdest thing, weirdest <laughs> wow. connection I've ever had with this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So from my understanding, I just knew that she drowned her children. I didn't know exactly why. So you said she was jealous of her husband. Was he cheating on her or something? And he and she yeah. caught her. There there's several versions of the story. Supposedly it takes place the version that I grew up with or that I knew and that I hear the most of, it was in Mexico in new spain you know when it was colonial mexico and he was in the military and he was very handsome and all the women were after him and she had heard rumors of him cheating on her oh wow so that's how he was that's how she was going to get back at him oh, so wow. that's the story and then she threw the kids and and it's always two kids no matter yeah. where you go in South America, it's two children. In Mexico, in Central America, it's two kids. And it's usually a boy and a girl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then the movie was true to that. The movie oh, okay. showed that too. Yeah. I need to watch the movie. I think I remember hearing about it. Um, yeah. So I definitely think that's like one of the most popular ones. The other one mm -hmm. is the Chupacabra. Can you talk about, about the El Chupacabra? Yeah. Well, that's interesting because it originally came, the whole idea of the Chupacabra, well, where it first got revealed was out of the Caribbean in Puerto Rico, that's where these sightings and things started and in the mid early and mid 1990s. And then um, a Latin American talk show, Christina, um, I don't know if a lot of your viewers might not or your listeners might not be familiar with her. She was a Cuban talk show host out of Miami broadcast on Univision to hundreds of millions of people. People don't realize, you know, the market for Spanish television is gigantic because in America, we have what, 330 million people in the United States, but in Latin America, the Spanish speaking part of it, it's half a billion people almost, mm -hmm. you know? And so this Cristina or Cristina, as they say in, you know, the, the Caribbean Spanish, they drop the S's, right? Uh -huh. So on this Christina show, she talked about the Chupacabra, and that was broadcast all over the place. You know, bigger audience than Oprah, right? Hard to believe. Mm -hmm. But so in Mexico, they they started hearing about this, and then all of a sudden there were Chupacabra sightings in Mexico. Now, let's unpack that. What does that mean? Does that mean that it's mass hysteria and people are imagining things because they saw it on TV? Or does that mean now people feel like they have permission to talk about it? Because now, since it's been on TV, someone in a little town in Mexico will say, hey, you know what? Maybe I'm not crazy. Maybe that creature that came into my yard and attacked my goat or whatever, maybe that's what this was, mm -hmm. you know? And so the sightings were were very numerous in the late 90s, right after this Christina show. Uh, and they seem to peak at around 2000, 2005, and then have gone down since then. But there are still sightings. In fact, in northern Mexico, just in the past year, year and a half, in this town called Lerdo, there was, there was a whole bunch of sightings of this creature and all these dead animals. And so I did a show called The Lerdo Monster, because is it the Chupacabra? Is it something new? It seems mm -hmm. like it, it's following the same pattern of this Chupacabra, which means goat sucker. There's usually like two um, puncture wounds in the animal's neck, and the animal is what they call exsanguin exsanguinated. All the blood, I, 
don't know if I said that right. <laughs> but all the blood is sucked out. Yeah. And so in this town of Lerdo, these little ranchos that are around there, there were like hundreds of animals that got their blood taken out of them. Mm. Some people in this case of Lerdo, these a lot of the, the ranchers there were saying, you know, we've been seeing strange white vans. We've been seeing, you know, these gringos around here where, you know, they're, they, we don't have outsiders. There are some people who believe that there are, it's NASA or some U.S. intelligence agency that is performing experiments or has this uh, secret lab in the area mm. and something got out of the lab. But, you know, we, we don't know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, for the Chupacabra, you know, it makes me think, you know, sometimes you hear about these different these myths and their similarities like across the world, you know, but it's just like a different name or something. And it makes me think with the Chupacabra. Like, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but with aliens, like, and UFOs, like, sometimes there's, like, these cattle cattle mutilations that you yeah. see. Have you heard of that? So oh, I yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. same thing, you know? Yeah, well, you know, you can go one way or the other. You know, what is, what's causing this? You can say, well, it's a chupacabra or, you know, aliens. Or you can say, like, what they're saying in this little town now. It could be like some go in some U.S. government agency that's experimenting on these poor people's animals, you know, mm -hmm. like someone in a little town can afford to lose a cow or a goat, you know, come on. Mm -hmm. I know. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's bad for these people to have yeah. all of these these killings and stuff. But um, yeah, there's there's a lot of there are a lot of explanations for these things. And one thing that I tell people is. It's okay to maintain a sense of wonder. It's okay not to have all the answers to these things. It's all right. Oh, to yeah. say, it's okay to say, hey, man, I don't know. Yeah. And then, you know, I'd rather be that way and throw my hands up in the air and say, we really don't know than to go down a rabbit hole that oh, doesn't yeah. have a that doesn't have a bottom to it. Yeah. You, know, you can you can obsess over little details and then keep going and then just be caught in the weeds and you know and I don't think that's a good thing. I just say, well, okay, we don't know. It's all right to wonder about these things. Okay, let's move on to the next topic and yeah. you know, investigate something else, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that approach. I love your mindset. I I feel the same way, like with my show, you know, I talk about conspiracy theories and spirituality and mm -hmm. some of these controversial topics. And I bet some of the people who watch, you know, I'm, I'm coming out with this stuff more recently. I barely started this YouTube channel and I bet some of my, my friends and people that I know in real life, they watch it and they're like, man, he's crazy. What? Is, damn, he, <laughs> he believes that. And it's like, no, like I, I want the people to know, like, I'm like you, like, I don't know. I don't believe anything 100 percent but I'm open to it. I'll have you on, I'll have different people on and I'll hear them out and hear, hear their stories. And then I'll form my own opinion. And like you said, you know, and then move on to the next thing. Cause I feel like sometimes you can get so caught in one topic, one subject, and you go down these rabbit holes and you're going to find the information that you're looking for. If you want to believe it, you'll find that information. If you want to, if you want to find information against it, you'll find that. So like, just be open-minded, I think is a good way to go about these, about these things. Yeah. And you know, Imagine if you just had this narrow mind and this is how it is and this is how it is and everything. You know, I was on another show and it was a panel discussion and I was talking about UFO encounters and saucer crashes and aliens in Mexico. And one of the guys on the panel said, well, we can all agree that there are aliens out there that have been visiting us. And I'm like, whoa, 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 no. Don't no, uh-uh. <laughs> I'm not gonna commit to that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm keeping it all open because yeah. I the the more I investigate this stuff, especially I mean, a lot of the the Ameri I know more about Mexican abductions and crashes and sightings and stuff than I do about my own country. And the more I look into what's going on down there, which is very similar to what we're experiencing, you know, supposed abductions and crashes and government taking away the, the debris and all of this stuff. The more I'm seeing that there's not a whole lot of substance to this. And what does that mean? You know? Um, and it's funny what you were saying about 
this ties into what you were saying about people thinking you're crazy or whatever. A couple of years ago, I had an intervention. <laughs> Someone <laughs> intervened. A, a, a relative of mine who lives in Bakersfield, I won't mention who it is, came down to San Diego because he was so concerned that wow. I'm talking about aliens and all this stuff. And I'm like, uh, have you ever listened to one of my shows? Or did you just hear from another relative that yeah. um, I'm talking about this paranormal stuff? You know, do me the courtesy of listening to just one show. Yeah, I provide, I provide the information. You know, like I said, I'm taking this from another place, another language, and I'm bringing it to the English speaking world. I don't, I don't think in all of my shows, I've come to any conclusions and said, this is what it is. If there is a mystery or whatever, I leave it up to the audience mm -hmm. and I leave it up to the audience to make their own mind up and also to do further research. And on my website, it, everybody has free access mm -hmm. to all of my shows and I'm on iTunes. You can listen to me there. And I have transcripts of all of my shows on my website for free mm -hmm. and underneath the transcripts i have references and you can follow up on the references if you want if you want to learn more about anything i talk about nice. i have that reference section and you know sometimes if you don't know spanish sometimes it's going to be hard because a lot of the stuff is you know there's no english translation but you know these packages google translate and a lot of these ai packages have now foreign language translation it's easy to 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 translate this stuff now so if you want to do more research you can there's stuff out there a lot uh, some of this stuff is my own experience but mm. a lot of it is stuff that's that you can follow up with yourself yeah yeah i love that approach you know um like i said you know i i'm the same way i won't commit to anything 100 percent but I do, I would say I do lean towards believing in some of the stuff. I do lean towards it, but mm -hmm. I, I, I'm just open, you know, and I, um, I know that I've had certain guests on my show and I, I want the listeners to understand too, that I've had certain guests on my show where there's, they've said some outlandish things and in my head, I'm like, yeah, like I'm, I'm shaking my head. Oh, you know, that's cool or whatever. But in my, in my head, I'm like, dude, I don't agree with you, but I'm not going to, my podcast, I don't want to be like, a, I don't want to have a debate. I'm not here to, to debate with people. Right. And, and because I'm just, I'm just open. So I think, like you said, that's a good way to go about it. Um, so just a second ago, you said you do have some personal experiences with some of this stuff. Um, could you touch on that a little bit more? Well, yeah, there's a lot of things. I mean, one, one thing that, that is really interesting from, my travels down there buying arts and crafts okay there's no other way that i could have stumbled on this other than going into the back country like i do okay here's an example um i was traveling in the back country of michoacan and michoacan is the home of the purepecha people they're they're also called tarascos in spanish or tarascans in english and they resisted the Aztecs. They had this big empire. And I think if they, if the Az, if the Aztecs weren't conquered by the Spanish, let's say the Spanish arrived a hundred years too late, the Tarascos, the Purepecha people, would have conquered the Aztecs. I think they had a very organized empire, whatever. But their language is still a living language. There are tens of thousands, if not a hundred thousand or more people who speak Purepecha. There's even radio stations there that broadcast in the language. So it's a very alive indigenous language that's there. So I'm traveling in the back country. I'm going from town to town buying arts and crafts. And there is a, a sign that was pointing to some ruins and it said Pyramide on it, which means pyramid in Spanish. And then underneath the, the icon for a pyramid, it said Yakata. And I was like, what's Yakata? And then I travel with drivers usually. I rent a truck. There are so many people in Mexico eager to take you around in their truck or whatever. So I always you know, go to check in my hotel, talk to the front desk clerk and say, hey, look, I need a truck and a driver tomorrow. And boom, they're there, right? So my driver, when I was in the backcountry of Michoacan, I said, what's Yakata? And he said, well, that's the Purepecha name for 
a pyramid or, a, or a, an old temple. And then he told me, he's talking to me, and he said, you know, I was driving around these tourists from Japan who wanted to go into the back country of, you know, and know the real Mexico or whatever, along these dirt roads and all of this stuff. And he said, the Japanese tourists asked me why that sign was in Spanish and Japanese. Huh. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, because the word for old temple in Japanese is Yakata, the same <laughs> as the Kurepacha name. Now, one day when I have time, I am going to see, I'm going to investigate further if there was some sort of trans-Pacific, some cross-Pacific yeah. contact with between the Japanese and the Purepecha because the Purepecha are on the Pacific coast and into the highlands of Mexico. Oh, okay. And they, they're a language isolate. That means they're not related to any language around. Anthropologists think that they came up from South America. They skirted the coast and mm -hmm. came up from South America, but oh. it's a little bit too coincidental yeah. that there's some Japanese connection. There could be, I don't know. I, I think it's a little bit too much of a coincidence, but there's an example of a really strange thing that I, you know, encountered that I probably wouldn't have been exposed to had I not been experiencing the country and the culture right there, you know? Wow. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Cause first when you were telling the story, I was thinking that that little village was like on the Eastern part of Mexico, but if it's on the Western part where the Pacific is, you know, then yeah, that seems a lot more likely. It could be, it could be true. That's, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. And back to your, back to your original thought and your original question about what, what other things that I have experienced that are not published or whatever. There was one time I was in Jalisco, I believe. And I was once again on these back roads. We went into a village and there was all this activity and stuff. And I was like, what's going on? Whatever. And then the guy, there was a guy there that said that there was a flying saucer that had landed in this guy's cornfield. And I'm like, okay, cool, whatever. And he was charging like 20 pesos or whatever. <laughs> and that's, you, that's Mexico for you, right? And we were driving by there and the, the guy wanted to charge 20 pesos to go into the field. And then there were people like selling gorditas and globos and things, you know, like this capitalism, petty capitalism just pops up out of nowhere in Mexico. People start selling things where there's a crowd. Right. Yeah. And so I was like, OK, I and I said to my driver, let's go. I'll pay for your admission. Let's, you know, drive down this road and whatever. And then he was afraid of the radiation, uh, you know, that there could be radiation. And then, so I didn't get to go. Oh, wow. Yeah. But. Oh, I thought, was... I thought you were going to end up saying that you went <laughs> and it was like some rinky dink little, <laughs> and like he was ripping people off saying it was a UFO or something. But yeah, he was afraid of the radiation. He was wow. afraid of the radiation. So we didn't go, but. <laughs> That was the closest I've ever gotten to a flying saucer crash or a landing. Wow. And that specific instance was not covered anywhere, yeah. not even in the local paper. There was yeah. nothing in the, the local news that said anything about a fr flying saucer landing in this guy's milk or this. Yeah. Field, but. So let's let's talk about the Mayans a little bit. You know, that's a big chunk of uh, Mexico's history. You know, yeah. there's the Mayan civilization. I don't know much about them. You know, I, I've heard about like the crystal skulls and, and I know that they were, they were very, very wise, man. Very, they were like astrologers, man. You know, they studied the the skies and they had a, such a, a profound concept of time. So um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, the Mayan civilization and, the, and the, maybe in the legend of the crystal skulls and stuff like that? Well, um, you know, I, it's funny. I did a show on the crystal skulls, but um just to give you some background, around 200 BC, the Maya civilization started to flourish. It just, it got started about that time. And it died off around 900 AD. That's when they start, they stopped carving things and making inscriptions. But then there was a renaissance that happened in the 1200s. There was a kind of a burst again of the civilization and People theorized that they had influence from central Mexico 
that was Toltec that mm-hmm. went to the Yucatan, which is a long way away, went to the Yucatan and then kind of revised the revived the Maya civilization for a little bit. Mm-hmm. But during these this time, 200 BC to about 900 AD, there was a lot of stuff going on. It wasn't an empire like the Aztecs. It was city states. People, you know, originally these uh, archaeologists and researchers who started uh, studying the Maya called them the Greeks of the New World, which is very appropriate because there was no Greek empire with city states. You have Sparta and Athens and stuff. And so the same thing with ancient Mexico and the Yucatan. You had these warring kingdoms. And they developed a writing system. They inherited a calendar. They didn't uh, develop it. It came from a previous civilization. They developed writing. They developed a a numeric system. They invented the zero. Now, in the old world, India, people believe the zero came from India. And it's a very important concept. You don't think much about numbers, but the zero is a very important concept. The Romans didn't have a zero. The the Maya had a zero. They in they came from it bubbled up from their civilization. I don't believe they had contact with other people, and that gets me a lot of flack. But you know, give credit where credit is due. This is indigenous genius that just came that was developed and fed on each other. There was there were dense population centers. So when you have a dense population, you have a lot of people interacting, a lot of ideas, you know, uh, ex- a lot of idea exchange. And so you have this, you know, this incredible civilization that developed and the collapse, people are still trying to figure out what happened. I mean, I think just like any other empire civilization is just kind of, you know, got overextended, taxed out the environment, whatever. But there's a lot there's a lot that we are still learning. And with the Maya, we are learning th- new things by the week. Every mm. week, there's new stuff that's coming out. There's new interpretations of their writing. They're discovering, you know, whenever they discover a new, like, monument that has writing on it, that's a treasure trove of information. So, yeah, the Maya, were fascinating, fascinating people. Yeah, this might be an ignorant question, but it's making me realize how little I know. So did the Aztecs okay. did the Aztecs take over Maya? Were they clashing with each other or is that completely unrelated? No, it's it's unrelated and it's because the the Aztecs were in central Mexico and the Maya were in eastern Mexico mm. in the Yucatan Peninsula then the states of Tabasco and Chiapas, the jungle areas there. Uh-huh. And so the back to the timeline 200 bc to about 900 a.d that's when the maya flourished now if you go west from the maya area to central mexico the aztecs came on the scene around 1300 a.d they were new oh Oh, okay they were very new and they had migrated from the north i think they are the refugees from chaco canyon in new mexico that whole chaco culture the anasazi from the American Southwest, a lot of researchers would agree with me when I say I think that when this big drought happened throughout the Southwest, people moved south. And so the Aztecs appeared in central Mexico in the 1300s, and their languages related to a lot of the indigenous languages Mm. that are in the Southwest and Mm. the, the plains of the United States. So yeah, the Maya and the Aztecs they are different and yeah, different regions. Yeah. And so I think that there's, there's a theory or it might even be fact now that, you know, the pyramids of Egypt are aligned with, I forget which constellation it is in the sky. Is it Orion, Orion's belt? And so what about the pyramids in Mexico? Do those align with the, the Orion's belt as well? Do you know? They don't align with the Orion's belt, but there is sacred geometry in pretty much all of these sites. They're yeah. built on a certain axis that's off, um, you know, true north. And usually, like, if you go to any of the big ruins in Mexico, they are astronomically aligned. And, like, in the case of the Maya, we're go- 
we're recording this on the 12th of March. And in nine days, magic is going to happen at Chichen Itza, one of the big Maya cities. Uh -huh. And I've been there several times. But what happens in the spring equinox, right on that day, the first day of spring, the shadow of a snake, Quetzalcoatl, also called Kukul Khan in the Maya, shadow of a snake appears on the staircase. What? <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's a what is it? What is it? To see. It's the, the shadows that they, they set up the pyramid so that those shadows are cast on the equinox. And it's symbolizing the snake, Quetzalcoatl or Kukul Khan, one of the most important and one of the oldest gods in Mexico. Goes back thousands and thousands of years. So what is casting the shadow though? Um part of the building. Oh. So Part of the, you know, because the way that it's built, uh -huh. part of the, the building, one face of the building casts the shadow uh, on the staircase and then so, you see the snake. Uh, so yeah. it's the way the way they designed it was kind of yeah. showing their respect to the God, right? Right. And it's, wow, yeah. you know, like you and were it's saying. it's on the, on the spring equinox, like they exactly, had it calculated. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So like you were saying about the Egyptian pyramids correlating to Orion, they looked at, the Maya looked at what I call the sky calendar or, you know, what's up there in the sky. And they, they built their cities accordingly. So, wow, yeah, it's really interesting. Are and you familiar? I, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say just, just about that staircase. Uh -huh. They don't do it anymore. I don't think you can climb that staircase anymore. But when I first went there, okay, this is, this is showing my age. I went there in 1992, the very first time I went there. And um, you could, at that time, you could go inside the staircase. There's another staircase, uh, like a secret staircase that goes inside the pyramid. And you can go, and I it's probably been long closed off now, okay? But you can go up this secret staircase inside the pyramid. And at the very top, there's a J, there was a Jade Jaguar. That that was pretty cool, man. I I mean, yeah, like I said, I don't think they let people do that anymore. But oh wow. So it was a it was a Jaguar made out all out of jade. Yeah. Oh wow. So, yeah, that, that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, Dan, we're already at an hour. I don't know how much time do you have left? Well, we can go maybe 15 minutes more. Or okay. Like sure. That. Um, so are you familiar with Billy Carson at all? No, I'm sorry. No? I don't know yeah, name. he's 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 really he's got his YouTube channel and his brand he's building called Forbidden Knowledge. And he's he's been all around the world and he's done so much research. And he he talks a lot about uh, ancient Sumeria and the Emerald Tablets and this and that. And and one of his theories is he says he believes I don't know, I'll open to your ideas on it. He thinks that that there are such a similarity between the Egyptian pyramids and the pyramids over uh, in the Mayan area. He thinks that maybe there was a connection. Maybe they did did travel over that way, or, or I don't know. Well, you know what? It's interesting. In the late 1800s, there was a theory that went the other way. Okay. Why does it always have to start in the old world? Uh, and that's what the theory was saying, that the Maya actually went to Egypt and seeded that civilization. <laughs> that it went the other way. Oh, it went from Mexico to there. But, I mean... There are things I'm very, very critical and very skeptical. And I have, like I said, a lot of experience with this stuff. I mean, I've been studying this stuff for more than 30 years. Well, even since I was a little kid, right? But the the whole contact between old world and new world, there's there are a lot of problems with, with that, I think. Um, for example, in the new world, there's no wheel. Now that's a very practical thing to use. Mm, yeah. And why wasn't that that very practical concept imported, you know, with these people wherever they came from, whether it was China? I mean, everybody claims it's interesting what I've seen. Every there, there's a claim on ancient Mexico from every civilization, the ancient Chinese, the ancient Indus Valley people, um, Egypt, whatever, even. The Vikings. I did a show about vo uh, this god, this minor god in the Maya area named Votan. Mm -hmm. Votan is also Wutan, Woden, 
Wednesday, Wednesday. Woden Wednesday. We have that in ancient Germany and the Norse areas. So there's this god Wotan whose day of the week is Wednesday. Okay, that's weird, right? That appeared in the Maya area around when the Vikings were at their height. So, but could that have been, you know, a Viking traveler? Well, maybe, you know, uh -huh. but there's a lot of questions I have about old world and new world contact because we're missing some things like mm. the wheel or horses or, you know, other other things that would have been introduced. There's no language connection, DNA. There's a lot of things that are missing. Now, absence of evidence doesn't necessarily mean yeah. that it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But those are problems that I have. Those are questions. And, yeah. you know, keeping an open mind once yeah. again. Once again, yeah. But um, yeah, in the open mind, like I said, it can go the other way too. People, people are claiming that this group went to mexico this group went even polynesians went to mexico but what about mexico going to the other places yeah. that's something that people don't think about too so who knows yeah i think the concept of the pyramids especially egypt it's so fascinating how they were built and i've always as a kid i've always been so drawn to them and you know as i go along my research too i, I come to find of the theory that giants built them you know and what mm -hmm. are your thoughts on that well Okay, here, this is what I'll, I'll, I'll say my thoughts and then I'll give the counter argument to what I'm saying. Okay, I've been, I don't, have you been to Mexico at all? I mean, to these archaeological no, sites? No, not to those sites, no. Okay, these pyramids, the steps on the pyramids are made for someone who has about a size eight shoe, okay? American male size eight shoe. I know in England and other parts of the world, they have different shoe sizes. They have a whole different system. But if you're climbing the steps of these pyramids, it doesn't matter if it's a Maya pyramid, doesn't matter if it's Teotihuacan or Azteca or even Purépecha. These steps are small, okay? So that's what I say. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been on these pyramids. That's what I said. But then someone, someone came with something against what I said, a counter argument, which was good. I'll give them points for this. Mm -hmm. Now, the, what the person said was, well, those staircases were added later. The giants built the original structure, and then the Aztecs or whoever came by later mm. and found these monuments and then put their staircases of their own. Well, could that be true? Well, yeah, that's something I didn't think about. That's mm -hmm. why I love the comment section of my YouTube channel, <laughs> because people will share with me things like that, and I'm like... You know, that's a point that I didn't think of. Yeah, but that could be true. There are stories. There are lots of stories of giants. In fact, the last show that I did was a show about the Seri people. They they live in the deserts of northwestern Mexico in the state of Sonora. And they have a whole bunch of legends. They were one of the last groups to assimilate to the larger mestizo culture of Mexico. And they have a creation story where there, the earth was populated by giants and they were wiped out by a flood. And wow. that sounds like, and this is a remote people who live in the desert. Yeah. They were ignored for centuries. They were, they were very hostile to outsiders. They only became really integrated into Mexico, like maybe in the 1890s. And a lot of people, a lot of Seri people still live in their traditional way. And the government kind of like leaves them alone. But there were anthropologists who went into these villages, these communities to take down, you know, the legends and the language to try to get the language down before it became extinct. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in these legends, there's a legend of the beginning where there were giants and they were wiped out by a flood. By a flood. Yeah, by a flood. And then the little people were created. Wow. And then there's another, there's a legend from that area too, Tiburon Island, which is in the Gulf of California between Baja and what they call the mainland of Mexico, the Baja Peninsula. There are people living there who have this oral memory or this, you know, traditional memory in their oral, oral tradition about white giants that came to the island 
in boats. And we don't know who they were. I mean, they could have been, they could have been even English explorers in the 1400s or whatever, but we don't know how far back the legend goes. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that's just one little part of Mexico. But giants are all over the place. The Aztecs believe that giants built um, Teotihuacan so that there was a, a giant named Tenoch that built you know that and there were other giants there's there's a legend of a giant who appears and will show up at fiestas and birthday parties and stuff <laughs> and you're supposed to let the giant um i think he's called the ish Kamili. i'm probably not right on that one but he'll show up and you can't make him angry he shows up for the festivities and he may accidentally really hurt people with his dancing and and everything because he's into the music and stuff and you just let him be and then he'll go away but yeah yeah there are stories all over you know we only have an hour or whatever but yeah there are a lot of things we could be talking about yeah yeah i think that's interesting that you said that the flood kind of wiped out the the giants and then you think about the dinosaurs what is the theory that, that an asteroid hit right and wiped them out and what I've in the little bit of research that I've done in history around the world, it's almost interesting to me. It's like it's this cycle of like of uh, societies and civilizations just rising and falling, rising and falling all over the world throughout time. And it makes right. me think it makes yeah. me think about the Hindu gods. They believe in, you know, there's three gods, you know, the God of creation, the God of uh, preservation and the God of destruction. And it almost seems like this just repeating pattern throughout the world, generation, operation, destruction, you know, and it's just like, it makes me almost think, think like this reality is like, like there's an algorithm to it. There's a code to it or something where this and it happens resets. and it resets over and over, whether it's a flood, a mud flood, an asteroid, an earthquake. It's like, it's very interesting. Yeah. And according to the Aztecs, we're in the Quinto Sol. We're on the fifth sun because all the other universes got destroyed. And some of them were ruled by women, like Chalchihuitle. She was the god of, goddess of water, and she ruled over one of the sons, you know, ruled. Each son had its own ruler, and then it got destroyed for whatever reason, you know. And we're in the fifth Quinto Sol. We're in the fifth iteration of creation, according uh -huh. to the Aztecs. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I mean, you're right. It seems like everybody has, every culture has this, cycle of cataclysm or rebirth yeah. and you know and you know to use our terms that we use today a reset yeah know? yeah so. okay so yeah kind of closing it out you know here just a couple more questions so you know what do you hope listeners take away from listening to Me mexico unexplained and how do you aim to inspire curiosity and open-mindedness well what i what i want them to take away is a sense of wonder and a sense of a larger world and a sense of depth about Mexico, because Mexico gets a bad rap for a lot of things. It's, you know, the home of cartels and, all, you know, you, we know, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So I want them to, to get a, a richer appreciation for the country and to do their own looking around and investigating and learning. And I forgot, what was your second part of that question? Um, how, you know, how do you aim to inspire curiosity and open-mindedness? Well, I try to do the best I can with my shows and I encourage, I encourage people to either contact me or respond in the comments section. Mm. And hopefully that inspires more people. There's a lot of conversations going yeah. on, you know, and so hopefully that, that inspires people too. I love that. Okay. okay, and so can you discuss the importance of storytelling and preserving and passing down cultural knowledge and traditions, especially in the digital age? It's super important because, like I was talking about the Seri, there were people who went and sat down with the elders and stuff of that tribe and got the legends and stuff. And so why are legends important? Because there's always some truth to, to these things, or there's sometimes, I mean, mm -hmm. I would say most of the time there's something true in these legends. And so we need to know, we need to know what these are. And mm -hmm. it's important to 
disseminate the knowledge because whenever you have, like I was saying about the Maya, you have a bunch of people together and then the, the it's there's a lot of cross fertilization of ideas. Well, now we have the internet, we have the whole world. We have this internet hive mind, not to use a loaded term hive mind, but you know what I mean. And so it's important to get things even from the most remote indigenous group. It's important, I think, to, as long as we respect their beliefs, if they believe that sharing is okay, and culture, part of the definition of culture is that it's shared. But as long as it's okay with the people to share this, I think it's important. So then people will start to recognize patterns, connect dots. And, you know, then we we realize we're not so different, you know? Yeah. So. I, lo I love that answer. And something that I think about often, and I'm surprised a lot of people don't question it, is just to me, like, just the concept of our history that we're told, you know, it's like, when you think about it, that this is the year 2024. When you really think about it, 2024, like, let's break that down. Like, let's say the average lifetime, I mean, this is this is stretching it a little bit, but let's say the lifetime is 100 years. That's only 20, 20 generations. That's it. I think there's this, our our story goes way further than that way further than that well you know what i was looking into indigenous languages of mexico because there's like 150 of them and there's so much variety there and you can also look at the united states the rest of north america there's so much variety there that some linguists believe that it was impossible for such a a complex variety to develop in just 40,000 years or however, yeah. you know, the crossing of the, the land bridge, that theory, because it is just a theory. Yeah. And so, you know, I talked to this one guy who was, um, he was Lakota and he's like, no, this is, that's, you're told about the land bridge. No, our people have been here for a million years. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and like I said, you can get scientific. Look at the languages. The diversity yeah. of the languages can't possibly happen within the span of a few, you know, 40, 50,000 years. Yeah. It has to be a lot more than that. And so, yeah, I think, yeah, there's a lot more. And you you look at books like Forbidden Archaeology and, you know, things like that, where they're finding artifacts where they shouldn't be finding them and things like that. And you know, a lot of it gets dismissed by these official, um, you know, these official gatekeepers. Like in America, we have the Smithsonian. And in Mexico, they have something just like the Smithsonian. Mm. The Smithsonian, you know, you hear about, oh, they discover giant bones and then they dumped all of the evidence in the ocean or whatever. That's a famous story. Well, yeah. in Mexico, they have the Institute, the National Institute of Anthropology and History at Mexico City. They have at least one office in every state in Mexico. And whenever there's some sort of archeological find, they're right there. They are there because they have these offices all over the mm. place. And sometimes they shut down digs. Like oh, wow. there was a dig in a place called, there were several digs in a place called Acambaro, which I've gone to, I've been there and I've seen these artifacts with my own two eyes. In Acambaro, people were unearthing figurines in the shape of dinosaurs. Now, how could they be, who knew about dinosaurs when these figurines were made 2000 years ago? The Triceratops, all of these things. So they came, they swooped down and then they put the kibosh on any further digs in this town. Mm. And so, yeah, there are gatekeepers who will shut things down. Um, yeah, an interesting aside. Wow, yeah. That's very interesting. But I think um, we're our history goes back a lot to loop back around. Our history goes back a lot farther than I think we we can even realize. Yeah, when you look at the the ancient tribes of like Sumeria and there's different tribes in Africa, a lot of them they all say the same thing. They say we came from the stars. You know, we came from this certain constellation. So it's just this whole concept of time just blows my mind. It almost seems like there's such a relation between the future and the past. It makes makes me see time as cyclical. And it's just so strange. And I love I love having these conversations. So thank you for being on the show. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, can you tease any upcoming episodes or topics that listeners can look forward to on on your show? 
Well, the shorts are all, I'm always cranking out the shorts. So any day you go on TikTok, Mexico Unexplained on TikTok or in um, YouTube, I'm cranking out like three shorts a day or something, sometimes more than that. So you can go there to get these little brief snippets of things. And then every week you can go to MexicoUnexplained.com or my YouTube channel. And every week on Sunday, I drop a show unless I'm on a buying trip or something like that. Sometimes I try to plan around the trips, but whatever you just go to those places and, you know, go from there and go and follow your curiosity and see where it takes you. Awesome. Thank you so much. You know, I, I'm definitely want to maybe have you on again. I want to pick your brain some more. So awesome. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Robert, for meeting with me today. Thank you for sharing your story and your detailed research and the phenomena that you've come across. I want to thank the listeners for sticking around to the end. So once again, please tell everyone where to find your information. And I'll also add it to the description of the video. Yeah, simply MexicoUnexplained.com. You can go there. Start awesome. there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Bye.